Right, so this morning we're continuing our journey through the book of Mark or the gospel of Mark. And we're looking at chapter 7. And we're going to be going through uh, verses 1 through 7. I've entitled the message, Killer of True Worship. You might ask the question, why this title? Folks, who is after your worship? The enemy, the devil. He is the one who wants to derail your love. He wants to derail your adoration. He wants to derail your true worship of the Most High God. He wants to throw you off course. So let's pause for a moment and let's read our text. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 7. And this comes in light of the fact fact where Jesus was in the land of Gennesaret, the previous few verses. And he he came out when he came when they came out of the boat, immediately the people saw, ah, there's the Lord Jesus. And they came rushing and they mobbed him. Recognizing him, they ran through that whole surrounding region and began to carry out about on beds. Those who were sick, wherever they heard he was. He entered the villages, the cities, the country. They laid sick in the marketplaces. They begged him that they might just touch the border of his garment. Such was the power that went out from Christ. And as many as touched him were made well. That's the setting. Now, verse 1, chapter 7. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him. They'd heard of his fame. They'd heard of what this man was doing. And they had come from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of his disciples eating bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups, the washing of pitchers, the washing of copper vessels and couches. Then the, scri- then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And Jesus answers them and says, Well, the desire prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. I want to begin this morning by going back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And here, the setting in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we see the children of Israel standing on the verge of entering the promised land. And Moses, knowing the absolute importance of true worship, worship that flows from deep within, speaks out to the people. And he says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'll start in verse 1, just to give you the context of it. Moses speaking, now this is the commandment, And these are the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. These are the commandments of the Lord. These are the statutes of the Lord. This is the standard that your God, Yahweh, wants you to adhere to. That you may fear the Lord your God, verse 2, to keep all his statutes and all his commandments which I command you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it 
that it may be well with you and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Picture the whole nation of Israel standing there waiting to enter this land that God had promised them. A land flowing with milk and honey. And here the Lord is speaking through Moses, telling the nation of Israel, but this is what I want you to do. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There is one Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. There's the crux of the matter. You are to love the Lord your God with everything. Moses was fully aware of the vital necessity of true worship. That's why he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Because the heart is the control center. The heart is the governing faculty of a person. It is the seat for thoughts, for attitudes, for motivations, and for our actions. And the heart, it speaks of your intellect, your deepest identity. Your heart is at the very core of your being. Love the Lord your God with all your soul. It's an important aspect of man's nature. And in the Old Testament, it often refers to a person in his entirety as a living being. The soul refers to the immaterial part of a person. It is the essential being and the inner life of the body. It is also the emotional side. At physical death, when we die, the soul survives and is immediately in God's presence. Love the Lord your God with all your might is the next, next piece of that. With every possible effort in me, I'm to love the Lord my God. And this was the crux of the matter. The true worship involves the whole person, heart, soul and strength. And it's emphasized in verses 6 through 9. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Take these words that I'm speaking to you, the statutes, the commands, the standards of God, and put them in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. <laughs> when I read that the first time, I thought all these Israelites with a sign hanging on the front of their nose the statutes of God, I've got to learn them. And here they are hanging on the... Anyway. Um, how important are the statutes of God? How important is the truth of the word of God? These verses clearly explain how one informs the heart and builds a firm foundation for true worship in the heart. What kind of foundation do we have in our hearts? And what he's saying here is it's to be passed on to the next generation. Our children need to understand that building the right foundation in the heart is priority. There is elaborate emphasis on the importance of this. There's so many places we can go, but it's going to go to one or two. Note on, when Samuel, on, 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 on God's commission, was selecting David. He says in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, and we'll go verse 6. Samuel had found Eliab. And he says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Looking for a king, of course. And he finds Eliab. But the Lord said to Samuel, 
do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature. He might be a great big fellow and he might be a very handsome sort of folk. Don't look at that because I have refused him, God says. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at what's inside. Not what's on the outside. What's important is the heart. Then we see David who gave similar instruction to Solomon when handing over the kingdom to Solomon. And that is in 1 Chronicles. In 1 Chronicles 28. David says to Solomon, verse 9. As for you, my son Solomon... Know the God of your father and serve him, here it is again, with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all the hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Here's the importance of the heart. Here's the importance of a loyal heart. A loyal heart has a willing mind. And he says here, the Lord searches all the hearts and understands the intents of the thoughts. And he says to, he says to Solomon, seek him, seek him with all your might. And he will be found by you. Don't forsake him. And when Solomon was dedicating the temple, he spoke to the entire nation of Israel. In 1 Kings 8 verse 61, in fact, let me read verse 57 and 58 as well. May the Lord our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. May he not leave nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself, to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And verse 61, let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as it is this day. So what are we seeing here? Time and time again, godly leaders are pointing out clearly that true worship and true dedication to the only true God without compromise is paramount if you want to live peaceably. Just a little summary. They all refer to the condition of the heart. Samuel 16, 7 tells us, Samuel, the Lord looks at the heart, the inward man. 1 Chronicles, David speaking, the Lord wants a loyal heart. 1 Kings, Solomon speaking to the nation of Israel, you need a loyal heart. They understand that the only true change takes place in the heart Look at what the prophet Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 17. Find Jeremiah 17. In Jeremiah 17 verse 9, the prophet Jeremiah says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Folks, before you were saved, there was stuff buried in your heart that you didn't even know was there. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. There was stuff down there. And the, the, this, this, Jeremiah says, who can know it? I want it brought out. If I want to follow God, I need that to be brought out. Look at Psalm 139. Here we see in Psalm 139, David 
crying out to God. And he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David crying out to the Lord, please expose anything in my heart that is sinful, that is wrong, that is wicked. Expose it, Lord, and please help me. Lead me in the way everlasting. Just as a slight detour here, I just want to have a look at Proverbs 18, verse 1. There's a thought there. Proverbs 18, verse 1 says, A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. Why does a man isolate himself? He's protecting what's in his heart. But if I've got a, a, a good relationship and a trusting relationship with a brother, I want to share what's in my heart because I want to grow in Christ. And my brother, whom I trust, will probably, most likely, most definitely, <laughs> give me some wise judgment. Why are you doing that, Dennis? Why do you say that? Where did that come from? It's exposing what's there at the bottom that I might grow. If you go to Proverbs 27, I think it is. Proverbs 27, yes, verse 17. Here it is. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. There's the key to trusting someone in a discipleship relationship or in a, a loving relationship where you're able to share the very nuggets, the very deep things of your heart. And as you share and as you encourage one another, you grow spiritually. Why am I telling you all this? Because it shows the true condition of the heart. And it's out of the heart that everything flows. Hence the need for a biblical foundation of truth. If there's a true biblical foundation built in your heart, what comes out? And this can only be accompanied or accomplished in true, genuine believers. You need a, a changed heart. So when we come to our passage today, the final two verses tell us in Mark 7, verses 6 and 7, Jesus answered, the scribes and the Pharisees, well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Reading this, we might say Jesus is quite scathing here. So what is the problem? What is the problem here? Let me share some of my testimony to help you understand what is going on in this text. My wife and I were in a similar situation to what is described here for the first 35 years of our lives. We were good Catholics and strictly adhered as best we could to what the priests, bishops, cardinals, and Pope were telling and teaching us. And my own personal experience was that I was brought up in a Catholic home. I went to a Catholic school and was completely indoctrinated into the Catholic belief and traditions. And all through this time, I never owned a Bible was never encouraged to study the Bible. In fact, it was discouraged in our circle, so in, especially in my circle, and it was only the Pope who could understand the Scriptures and explain their meaning. So what did they do? In place of the Bible, we were given the book. 
the Catholic Missal. And with, it was full of what the church believed. And I went along blindly with what I was told. After all, I respected these so-called men of God. I was so convinced of my belief that I can even remember clearly telling a very close friend of mine after we came out of school, he had got saved. He had got saved and he approached us. He approached Albert and I actually. I can even see it when he approached us. Telling us how excited he was. He's now saved. Well, I told him in no mean terms, you need to renounce the religion that you're now embracing. That's what I told him. And you need to rejoin the Catholic Church as it is only Catholics that go to heaven. My life was steeped in tradition and I viciously adhered to man-made precepts and rituals believing the authority of the Catholic hierarchy, the priests and the bishops, etc. Whatever they told us, I accepted without question. After all, they knew the way to eternal life. And who was I to challenge them in any way in what they were teaching us? And so being well-groomed for many years from birth to about 35 years old or 30, 32 years old. Thank you. <laughs> I'll do that again. <laughs> being well-groomed for many years from birth to about 32 and a half years old. <laughs> 32 and a half years old in the Catholic way and belief system, I was very passionate about my religion. And so, of late when thinking about this, it causes me great embarrassment. Knowing how adamantly I defended a religion that was so full of error. And following a false gospel even though they spoke of the cross and of Jesus Christ. Eventually it came down, this is important. Eventually it came down to basing my salvation on my Catholic religion. In other words, measuring my spiritual condition against my conformity to the Catholic ceremonial rituals, traditional requirements, and, the, the, and following the man-made erroneous Catholic doctrines. That's how I based my spiritual condition. All this rather than a sincere love for God and humble obedience and surrender to His Word. And when I look back, I can see how divine biblical truth had got buried, had got lost and overshadowed under this false religion. All this traditional Catholic practice that we performed outwardly without regard to the condition of my heart. I can honestly say that I loved Jesus with my mind and I had a Catholic understanding of salvation which was based on a person's adherence to Catholic doctrine and not the Word of God. Now, as we saw at the outset of our message this morning, all these great men of God emphasized the heart. Why? Well, Jesus reaffirmed that what was taught in the Old Testament, that all thoughts and deeds flow from the heart. Matthew 15 tells us in verses 18 and 19, Those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, theft, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. So here we see that the wrong foundation in a heart produces these sinful practices. And in Luke 6.45, we see this mentioned again. A good man 
out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. The question is, what is the treasure in my heart? Is it good things? Good things equals the truth, equals God's word. But he goes on to say, an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. If the foundation in your heart is not good, something else comes out. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So there's the importance of having a sound biblical foundation built into your heart. Let's return to Mark 7. We're traveling around a bit. Mark 7. When we come to returning to Mark 7 verse 5, we see the anger of the Pharisees and the scribes as they ask Jesus this question. Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Why? It incensed them that Jesus did not stop his disciples as they openly disregarded the hand-washing ritual which they considered so binding. And the lead up to that, verses 2, 3, and 4, when the, when the scribes and Pharisees saw some of the disciples eating bread with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold to, like a washing of cups, pitchers, copper vessels, and couches. This most common ritual cleansing was the washing of, of one's hands with a handful of water, a required formal practice before eating food. And this was especially important if they had come into contact with unclean Gentiles or such things as money or utensils or other instruments. And interestingly though, Mosaic law only prescribed ceremonial washings for priests and did not require others to wash hands in any particular way before eating. This had nothing to do with sanitation, but everything to do with rabbinic ritual tradition. They claimed that disregarding this regulation, disregarding this tradition, and many other of these, according to the elders' traditions, was sin, and being obedient in following them, was the essence of goodness and service to God. Well, the problem is that this had nothing to do with God's word. Nothing. It was man's makeup. And so, in our passage, we see the conflict between the religious leaders and Jesus. It, emphasize, it emphasizes the rejection that Jesus encountered in Israel despite his public popularity. These champions of the legalistic, Judaistic, Old Testament law, the law was good, of course, and rabbinic tradition knew that the message of Jesus was a direct assault on their system of self-righteousness. And from verse 1, we see that the scribes and Pharisees all came from Jerusalem. And why? Why? for the purpose of seeking ways to discredit Christ and ultimately to kill him. Such was their hate for him. How dare he come, a, come against our traditions, our rituals, and the way we do things. Instead of pointing people to the Lord God, their obsession for people to not break the law was totally undermined by their extra-biblical regulations and rabbinic rules. And as I shared from my own experience in the Catholic Church, the Jewish people began to measure their spiritual condition in terms of their external conformity to the traditional requirements and ceremonial rituals. 
How sad. And Jesus' response to the accusation of the scribes and the Pharisees in verse 5 was not to make any reference to his disciples' conduct. Rather, he addressed two issues underlying the question. The true source of religious authority, was it tradition or was it the scriptures? And we see that in verse 6 verse, through to verse 13. And that's further than we're going. But of course it was the scripture. And he confronted the calloused unbelief that characterized the false system that they embraced. Verse 6 tells us, He answered and said to them, Well did as I prophesy of you hypocrites. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So in Christ's frustration, he reaches back to the prophet Isaiah, calling the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites. Why? Because they appeared holy on the outside, but were corrupt and unrepentant in their hearts. And they had no genuine love for God. Boy, did he tear a strip off them in Matthew 23. This is what he says in Matthew 23, verses 27 and 28 and 29. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which, are, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous. If that's not scathing, I don't know. Jesus was not at all happy with what they were propagating. And in verse 7, he says, in vain, this is Mark 7, verse 7, in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. I'll read verse 8 too to give you the context there. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. That's what they were doing in effect. We don't want God's commandment. We're looking to the tradition of the elders. We're looking to what man has said and what man has made up. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers, cups, many other such things you do. Things of no consequence. So, Isaiah's prophecy struck at the heart of the Pharisaical system, where they gave every appearance of loving God, but it was only a pretense as they worshipped him in a superficial way. And that was contrived. It was unbiblical and it was certainly unacceptable. Folks, apostate religions elevate man-made traditions above the word of God. And here we see how true worship is killed by these leaders insisting that their rituals, their traditions, their regulations and their rites, all outward appearances, replace heartfelt obedience and true worship. Paul speaks of this in Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Paul says, Beware, lest anyone should cheat you. Now, you've got to understand what that word cheat means. The word cheat there means to plunder or to take you captive. So beware, lest anyone plunder you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. If we're going to go according to Christ, we've got to go according to His Word. I'm not saying that all traditions are bad. Not all traditions are bad. We need to be in fellowship on a regular basis. That's a wonderful tradition. But we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful with traditions, that they're not man-made traditions. Okay, and the other, the other verse that I want to read here is verses 20 to 23, uh, where Paul says to the 
the Colossians. You died with Christ from the basic principles of the world. Why is it that though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle with all concern, which all concern things which perish with the using according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These commandments and these doctrines of men are going to perish. They're going to disappear. They're just traditions. They're just regulations. And he says, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and the neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Our whole Christian walk, as we enter this race, this Christian race, is to grow in Christ. We're to grow in Christ. What happens when we grow in Christ? Selfishness, self-desires, those things that come against the very st statutes of God start dying in our lives and dwindling and disappearing as we grow in holiness, as we grow in righteousness. And we put down the indulgence of the flesh because where we want to be indulgent is in God's word, is in our love for our Savior, is in our worship of the only true God. So it is impossible to worship God if there's no transformation on the inside. All your attempts will be hypocritical. True worship, by contrast, flows from the soul that has been regenerated and one that eagerly seeks to honor and submit to the will of the Lord. The changed heart, regenerated by belief in our Savior Jesus Christ, loves God and it desires to obey Him. A changed heart is purified and it produces good fruit. What is a changed heart? Well, you all know this. You've heard it hundreds of times. It's a heart that has gone to Christ and says, Lord Jesus, you are the Son of God. I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin. I'm sorry, Lord. Please forgive me. I need you. I need a Savior. I want to be with you for all eternity, Lord. Save me. It's a heart that yearns and cries out to the Lord. You know, John 4 tells us this. John chapter 4, verse 23 and 24 tells us this. The hour is coming and now is when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. To be a true worshipper of God, we have to worship Him in spirit. That's why there is such an emphasis on salvation. Ephesians 2.1 says that you are dead in your trespasses and sins. That's before salvation. Dead. The word dead there is stone dead. Stone dead. Morse do it. <laughs> Good Afrikaans word, Morse do it. Stone dead. I told that story in another church once. And the little boy looked at me. Stone dead. And I, I, I had this flash. I said, it's like that dead possum that you saw on the road. It can't move. It can't do anything. It is stone dead. It's turning to powder. After the service, he comes up to me and he says, Uncle Dennis, what happened to that possum? <laughs> I said, it remained stone dead. <laughs> so, before we are regenerated, we are stone dead. That means our spirit is dead. Our spirit cannot worship God. We have to have a regenerated spirit, and that comes through genuine salvation. Now, Jesus did not insist that the disciples follow rabbinic tradition and customs. 
as the only authoritative directives to follow were from Scripture. The purveyors of tradition which conflicted with the Word of God had to be exposed and overturned as they influenced many. The accusations of these Jewish leaders that Jesus and his disciples were committing a serious offense was cleverly overturned by Christ, showing that the real offenders, those guilty of real crimes against God, were the scribes and the Pharisees, as they were leading their followers to eternal damnation. In, in Matthew 23, it, it speaks of that. I'll just, just read you that verse, Matthew 23 verse 15. We're told there, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, for you travel over land and sea to win one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. What is a proselyte or a proselyte? It's one who is converted to follow your own opinions, your own thinking, and your own man-made doctrines. And that's what they were doing. And that's what Christ said to them. You make them twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. Boy, what an indictment. False religious, false religions today are hidden and camouflaged very often behind a facade of Christianity, which really teaches a false gospel. They promote the outward trappings of health, wealth, and prosperity in some cases. And without the proper regard to holiness, to righteousness, to humility, and to total surrender to the Lordship of Christ and His true word. Folks, we don't want to be lumped together with this, pro pro this prophecy of Isaiah in Mark 7. None of us ever want to be lumped together with that prophecy it would bring horror to anyone who is serious about the Lord. Our greatest desire is to be worshippers who worship our God from hearts that love and adore Him. Hearts that are regenerated. Hearts that are born again into eternal life with a wonderful hope of eternity with our Lord and Savior in glory. The alternative is horrific. Hearts that are flowing with God's word, which are rooted and grounded in the truth. Salvation that is solely based on Christ and his gospel that motivates us to care for and share it with those who don't believe. And I know, speaking to a number of you, how some of us agonize over our children, how we agonize over our parents, our uncles and our aunts. I know that. I agonize sometimes over my own children, not sometimes. But we pray for them, that they would get saved. The alternative, the alternative is just too horrible to con contemplate. So, we we're called to share the truth. Share it boldly with others, that they might get saved. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is your word that is truth. We thank you, Lord, that it is your word that stirs us, that spurs us on, that changes our lives completely, that causes us to walk in your ways, that causes us to look to you, to worship you, our only true God. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit in our hearts that opens this word to us as we are your children and follow you. And Lord, I pray over this week that each one of us would be sensitive to opportunities that we have to share truth with unbelievers and with folk we come in contact with. Please help us, Lord. Please give us the energy and the desire and the strength to do just that. And we do thank you for times like this where we come together to worship together, to encourage one another and to see your word impacting our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.